Okay, well, it seems like it's been a while since I've taught, uh, so maybe several weeks at least, but I am still continuing uh, my series on what I have called the priesthood of King David. Uh, so this is the eighth message in that series, in case you have uh, lost count. This is also the second to last message in the series, so there is still one more to go after this. But this is the second to last message. And if you're worried that your memory of the past messages may not be so good, uh, don't worry because there's lots of review in this message. This is really meant to be a message that takes everything we've seen so far and pull it together into one piece and then say a few more things additionally. So lots of review in case you're worried about not remembering so well. So let's start with reviewing my last message actually, just so we can get that fresh in our minds. The last message I taught was called the Priestly Kingship of David, which really was a message that was given over to points that I wanted to make, but there wasn't any good place to put them. So they just all wound up in one message together but I called it the priestly kingship of David. And as we read the book of Samuel, uh, first and second Samuel, we see that many of David's royal actions have a connection to the priesthood and priestly efforts. So that was the, there was at least some connecting idea to those things I was putting in that message. And of course, this is one of the several ways that the author of Samuel marks David as the fulfillment of that prediction toward the beginning of the book about the coming of a faithful priest. So one of the ways that the author of these books marks David as the fulfillment of that is showing you various things like I talked about in that message. So I talked about four things and I want to review them for you. First of all, that David had a great interest in places of worship and atonement. So unlike most kings <clears throat> who are building palaces and fortresses, David is more concerned about places of worship and atonement. And we saw this first in his moving the ark into Jerusalem, which is, of course, a, a very big part of his reign. And then secondly, David's desire to build a temple, even though he himself did not build it, it was his idea to build a temple. And then after that, he actually was very important in establishing the site of that temple during that whole scene with the census and the plague and all of that toward the end of the book. So David's interest in places of worship and atonement, very much a priestly concern. And the second point that in that message was that the priesthood was part of David's administration and not a distinct branch of government. So the whole idea being that the priests serve under David, who is himself over those priests. And that was important because I showed you that for most of Israel's history, Israel had a two-branch government. There was a real division between the secular power and the sacred power. The king or the military leader or whatever was over here. The lawgiver like Moses or Joshua, the military leader, or a king later on. And then over here was the priesthood. And you have two branches of government that are very much equal to each other. However, in the time of David, you see something very different. You see the priests actually serving under David, who himself fills the role of high priest. So that is a very priestly aspect of David's kingship. And then third, following on the heels of that, David himself appoints priests who are not descendants of Aaron, which is a pretty big factor uh, in terms of how clear the law is about that, about the sons of Aaron being the priests. Here comes David, and he first of all appoints some of his sons as priests, which is pretty big. And then also you have later on this guy named Ira the Jerite, who is kind of mysterious in that we don't know exactly who he was, but looking at his, uh, his name there, Ira the Jerite, and his lineage, he is not from the house of Aaron, yet he was made a priest. So you see David taking it upon himself to expand the priesthood, very much acting as lord of the priesthood in that time. So that's certainly a priestly aspect of his reign. And then finally, I mentioned that David has the unswerving loyalty of the Levites and the priesthood during the rebellion of Absalom. Absalom was of course one of David's sons who tried to overthrow him and become king in his place. And we saw that the Levites at that time were willing to be exiled with David and the priests were all serving as David's spies. So you see David's greatest support really came from them along with probably his own tribe, the tribe of Judah. But you see the priests very much serving as king's men 
and that, at that time. So David enjoying his greatest support from the most religious tribe, the tribe of the priests. So all of that just to say there are many priestly aspects of David's reign as king. Even his royal actions have a very priestly flavor. And again, that's one of the ways that the author of the book of Samuel marks David as the fulfillment of that prediction. And I'll read that prediction again here in a moment. But uh, first of all, just to introduce the idea of this message tonight, again, this message is meant to be, to some degree, a pulling together of all past things and then adding a little bit more to it. I'm calling this message tonight, The Faithful Priest and God's Anointed. And you'll see why I call it that in a moment. And what I really want to do is I want to come back to the central passage of this series and remind you of what it is and spend a lot of time on that tonight because we haven't really come back directly to it for a while now. So let's read this. This is the prediction that was made by the man of God. We don't know his name. He's just called the man of God. This was the prediction he made to Eli, the high priest, about this faithful priest who was going to come along and replace his house in the priesthood in some way. So let's read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27 through 34. And then we'll read a, a few more verses after we set the tone here. 1 Samuel 2, verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I, not, did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break the strength and the strength break your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all the good that I do for Israel, and an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar, so that your eyes will fail from weeping and your soul grieve, and all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. This will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. Okay, now here we come to the real part where he gives the central passage of this series and what might very well be the central passage of the entire book of Samuel. He says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. Everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, Please assign me to one of the priest's offices so that I may eat a piece of bread. So here we see the promise of the faithful priest who will have an enduring house, who will be after God's own heart, and all these things about him who is coming to, in some way to replace the house of Eli and the house of Aaron, which have been unfaithful. And that has been really the chief concern of this series to discover who that faithful priest is and I've been making the argument that it's actually King David. That David is not just the king in the book of Samuel, but he is also this faithful priest. So I've spent seven messages and now eight messages talking about that. Now today, I want to return very directly to this prediction made here at the beginning of the book and talk about it again more directly for the first time in several messages. I have three goals for today. First, I want to review how most of the prediction made by the man of God to Eli has been fulfilled by David. So this is very much a review portion showing you all the things we've been talking about and how all of that stuff about David connects to this prediction. The second thing I want to do is I want to eliminate the only other candidate who might be the faithful priest other than David. 
I've already talked about Samuel as a possible candidate. I've told you why I don't think he's the faithful priest. But there's another guy mentioned in the books of Samuel who might qualify, and I want to show you why he is not the faithful priest either, which should clear the way for King David, hopefully in your minds. Otherwise, this whole series has been in vain. But that's my second goal for tonight. And then my last goal, my third goal, is I want to address the last part of the man of God's prediction, which I have not yet addressed. And that is the part where he talks about, he will walk before my anointed always. I have not said anything about that at all in this series, and I finally want to come around to that and talk about it and show how David fulfills that even. So those are my three goals for tonight. And of course, as you can tell, this is very much meant to pull everything together into a nice, neat hole in your mind. It's not the last message of the series. I have one more message I want to do after this one to do something yet further. But tonight, hopefully this will take a lot of the rough edges so far and smooth them out and get us ready to finally finish this series the next time I teach. But that is the idea for tonight. So, let's start with my first goal, the first division of my outline. So far in this series, I have already shown you how most of this prediction made by the man of God to Eli has been fulfilled by David. I've been doing it very piecemeal, bit by bit, going through very slowly, showing you these things. However, I do think that most of this prediction, I have demonstrated how David has fulfilled it. The key word of that statement is most. Of course, there is some unfinished business here, and that'll be dealt with at the end of this sermon. But for the most part, I think you can see now, as we come back to this prediction, how David really does fill the role of this faithful priest. Now, this prediction overall makes five assertions. I want to talk about four of them, the four that I have covered, and show you in a very orderly way how King David fits this description of this faithful priest. So the first assertion that I'll start with, the very basic one, God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. So there's the very foundational, basic assertion of this prediction. God is going to raise up a faithful priest. This is in contrast to the house of Aaron, which has become wicked in the days of Eli and his sons. And the book of 1 Samuel begins talking about all the wickedness that was there, especially in Eli's sons, but also somewhat in Eli himself. Now God's going to come in and replace all of that. And surprisingly, I think the man who steps in to fill that role is actually King David so that he is not only a king, but also a priest. Now, in the book of Samuel, this is most plain in cases where David's actions only make sense if he is meant to function in a priestly role. There are things David does in the book of Samuel that are kind of weird unless you view him as some kind of priest, in which case they begin to make sense. For example, we have the incident in 1 Samuel 21, where David eats the showbread of the tabernacle, which is that bread that the priest set out uh, as part of the ceremonies there in the tabernacle, and only the priests are allowed to eat that bread. Well, then David comes along and eats it. You know, in doing so, he seems to show priestly privilege. He has the priestly right to eat that bread without guilt. Another example would be the occasion where David wears the ephod as he brings the ark into Jerusalem, of course, in that big parade that's there, that's already a very priestly occasion. But on this occasion, <clears throat> David actually wears the high priestly garment, the ephod, which is the distinctive garment of the priesthood, yet here's King David wearing it. Again, it's kind of strange, but if you view David as being a priest, it makes sense. So those are the, pl those are, those are the plainest ways that the book of Samuel makes this argument that David is a priest. However, there are also more subtle ways that he does this. And I talked about the journey of the Ark of the Covenant that we see toward the beginning of 1 Samuel, all the places that you see the Ark of the Covenant go. You see this in 1 Samuel 3 through 7, chapters 3 through 7. You see the Ark get captured by the Philistines. It gets returned to the city of Beth Shemesh. And then it finally ends up in kiriath Jerim, where it stays for about 20 years. So you see this, the Ark of the Covenant being carted around here and there. Well, I pointed out that the city of Beth Shemesh was a priestly city, 
and that the city of Kiriath Jerim belonged to Judah. Okay, so you have two different tribes there represented, the tribes of Levi and the tribes of Judah. So it makes sense for the ark to go to Beth Shemesh as a priestly city, but then when they totally uh, mistreat the ark, if you want to call it that way, and they get judged for it, and then it goes to Kiriath Jerim, a city of Judah, you actually see a transfer of priesthood there implied. You see the priesthood act uh, irresponsibly by losing the ark to the Philistines to begin with. That was Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, who did that. Then when they finally get the ark back, that city, that priestly city, does not treat the ark well. So they totally botch everything and lose their right to be the custodians of the ark of the covenant. And then the ark goes to the tribe of Judah, where it stays for 20 years. Israel does very well at that point. It's a very subtle way to make this argument, but it shows you that the priesthood is being moved from the house of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi, to the tribe of Judah, which is David's tribe. So the ark and the priesthood, therefore, become more closely associated with King David. And then that is made all the more apparent when David himself takes the ark and brings it to his own city of Jerusalem, where he's wearing the ephod and all that. So you see this very subtle argument here with the movements of the ark, implying that some kind of transfer of priesthood is taking place as you see the ark moving around. Whether it's in very plain ways or very subtle ways, the book of Samuel seems to mark David as a priest, which means he fills the role of this faithful priest promised by the man of God in his prediction to Eli. And that brings me to the second assertion, that this faithful priest will do according to what is in God's heart and soul. He'll be according to God's heart and soul. This is another thing that the man of God said. And here we see that to find this faithful priest, if you're looking, if you're an Israelite living at this time and you're wondering who is the faithful priest mentioned by this man of God, you're going to be looking for a person who is in some sense after God's own heart, a man according to God's own heart. Well, thankfully, we don't need to look further than King David because King David is explicitly called a man after God's own heart. And phrases like that are used a few different times throughout the book of Samuel to talk about him. Of course, most uh, classically, 1 Samuel 13, when Saul loses the kingship and God says he's going to give it to someone else, he says he's going to give it to a man after his own heart, who is King David. But that matches the description of the faithful priest from the man of God. And you see David called things like that from time to time. So you see the only man, the only man in the book of Samuel who was called a man after God's own heart, is David. So that makes him like this faithful priest who is promised back here to Eli uh, by the man of God. So you see how David fulfills that second assertion. The third assertion of that prediction by the man of God is that God will build an enduring house for this faithful priest. Or if you're using the ESV, it's a sure house. But either way, God is going to build an enduring house for this faithful priest. So again, if you're an Israelite looking for this faithful priest, who is he? You're looking for someone for whom God will build an enduring house. Well, the only other use of that phrase, enduring house or sure house, in the book of Samuel, <clears throat> is when Abigail is speaking to David in 1 Samuel 25, when she's very much trying to get him to calm down and not go kill everyone, uh, that because of uh, Nabal's foolishness, you know, her speech to him mentions that God is going to build for him an enduring house. The only other time in this book where that phrase is mentioned. And of course, we have a much more powerful passage later on where God makes his covenant with David. And the whole promise of that is that God is going to build David a house that is going to last forever. It is a house that is going to endure. So again, the only other person in the books of Samuel who is said to have an enduring house, is King David. So if you're looking for a faithful priest with an enduring house, your mind is going to go to David. David is the one with the enduring house, therefore he is the faithful priest. And then we have this fourth assertion, the last one I'll talk about it for this stage in, the series, in this, this sermon anyway. The fourth assertion is that everyone who is left in the house of Aaron will come and bow down to this faithful priest and ask him for appointments to priestly offices, and for bread and for silver. So the basic idea is 
the remnants of the house of Aaron, you know, the remnants of Eli's wicked house, they're going to become completely dependent on the house of this faithful priest. They're going to be servants in every way to this faithful priest. So, who is it in the books of Samuel who fills that role? Well, you again see it in the life of King David. King David very much fills the role as the overlord of the remnants of the priestly house, and they are very much dependent on him. You see this first of all with Abiathar. If you don't remember, uh, Abiathar is the only priest who sur survived the slaughter of the priests at the city of Nob whenever King Saul came and was angry about them helping David at some point, and he just killed them all off. Abiathar was the only priest who lived in that city who actually survived. And David basically says, hey, come hang out with me, stay with me, I'll protect you. So you see that dependent relationship really begin there. You also see that when David becomes king, Abiathar and his uncle Zadok serve as priests under David as part of David's administration. Again, they're not a separate branch of government like Israel usually saw between the priesthood and the, uh, the secular authority. Instead, the priests were very much under David. So you see there, their priestly appointments depended very much on David. So you see that kind of thing there as well. Finally, you see the tight bond, as I mentioned earlier, between David and the priesthood and even the Levites during the rebellion of Absalom. They stay loyal to him. They serve him. They serve as his double agents to some degree. Uh, you see the tight relationship there. I mean, they are joined at the hip to David. You see this kind of close relationship and even a dependent relationship in many ways between David and the remnants of the priesthood. And that very much fulfills what is said here to Eli by the man of God in this prediction. So I can honestly say that four of the five assertions made by this man of God to Eli here at the beginning of the book have been fulfilled by King David. You can actually see how King David comes in and fills the role of this faithful priest in four out of five ways. <clears throat> As for that fifth way, I do plan to talk about that later, but for right now I have something else in mind. Before I answer that question about the fifth assertion and how David fulfills that, I want to do something else. I want to talk about the only other candidate who might be the faithful priest in the books of Samuel and talk about why he probably is not the faithful priest. Now, if you remember, I did address at some point in this series a man who might be another uh, candidate for faithful priest alongside of David, and that was Samuel, who was the judge and prophet of Israel. And I mentioned that you see him serving in very priestly roles, even high priestly roles at times in the book of Samuel. So you might look at Samuel and say, hey, what if he's the faithful priest of the books of Samuel? But I pointed out that he does not have an enduring house, which I think is the main flaw of seeing Samuel as the faithful priest. Without an enduring house, he really has no claim to be that faithful priest. So it's not him. Okay, so is there anyone else besides King David who might actually be this faithful priest? There is one other person that some have suggested. Again, there are not many suggestions for this passage. Most people don't really spend much time on it. But there is another man alongside David and Samuel who might be this faithful priest, and that man is Zadok. Okay, I have mentioned Zadok a few times in this series and even in this message. I've mentioned him once at least already. But you probably don't know who Zadok is off the top of your head, unless you remember very well. So let me give you an introduction to the man himself. Who is Zadok? Other than having a really cool name, who is he? Who is Zadok, right? Well, first of all, he is a, a member of the house of Aaron. He is of the priestly family. He is very much of the priestly house. Zadok is the great-grandson of Eli. Okay, So Eli was the uh, high priest that uh, caused a lot of trouble uh, by being faithless. Eli had Phinehas, Phinehas had Ahitub, and Ahitub had Zadok. So Zadok is the great-grandson of Eli. I can also say that Zadok is the brother of Ahimelech. And Ahimelech was the high priest killed by King Saul during that massacre of the priests at the city of Nob. Ahimelech was the one who gave David the showbread and gave him the sword of Goliath and all that. 
And uh, that's what uh, brought upon that, uh, that slaughter upon the city of Nob by King Saul. So Zadok is the brother of Ahimelech, right? And then finally, you can say that Zadok is the uncle of Abiathar. Abiathar was the priest who survived that slaughter. Apparently, Zadok was living somewhere else in the nation at that time, and he did not uh, see that slaughter happen. But Zadok is the uncle of Abiathar, so he's the older, uh, the member of the older generation as compared to this guy, Abiathar. Okay, so that gives us an idea of who Zadok is in the, uh, the family of Aaron, in the house of Aaron here. Now, I can also say that both Abiathar and Zadok have some prominence during the reign of David. They actually serve in priestly roles. Both Abiathar and Zadok are mentioned in the descriptions we have of David's administration, where it lists out the officers that David appointed over the nation, you know, over the army, over the forced labor, over this, over that. Well, the priests are mentioned, and there is a stage where Abiathar and Zadok are both serving as priests to King David. Also, Abiathar and Zadok serve as spies for David during the rebellion of Absalom. David actually sends them back to Jerusalem to uh, serve as his spies during Absalom's revolt. So you see here kind of what Zadok is doing during the reign of David. He is in some sense serving in a priestly role and even serving David in a way that is not very priestly at all, but very necessary for the time. One last note about Zadok is that he eventually does become high priest. That did not happen during the reign of David. That happened during the reign of King Solomon, David's son. And this happened after our old friend Abiathar got himself into some trouble. Uh, Abiathar was actually serving as high priest. And then whenever Solomon was becoming king, uh, Abiathar supported a rival contender to the throne and got himself exiled. I'm going to read 1 Kings 2.35 just to show you, just jumping into the story here. 1 Kings uh, 2.35. So the king here is Solomon. says, The king appointed Benaiah the son of Jehoiada over the army in place of Joab, and then the king appointed Zadok the priest in place of Abiathar. So Zadok eventually does become high priest during the reign of King Solomon. And that is all we know about Zadok from history. We don't know anything else about the man other than the things I have told you just now. So, Zadok. Some have suggested that Zadok might actually be the faithful priest mentioned back in 1 Samuel chapter 2 by the man of God. And they do have some reason for saying this. I can count three reasons why you might suggest that Zadok is the faithful priest mentioned by the man of God. First, he is a priest, and eventually a high priest. I mean, if you're looking for someone who's filling a priestly role, Zadok eventually does that. You know, after I talked about how in David's reign, there doesn't seem to be a high priest other than David, but once Solomon comes on the scene and Abiathar gets, you know, moved aside, Zadok comes in and serves as high priest. You could make the argument, well, there you go. He fills the role of a priest, therefore he's the faithful priest. Secondly, Zadok does seem to have, or at least some reason to say he has, an enduring house. Okay, that's a big one. The faithful priest is going to have an enduring house. Zadok seems to have that. First of all, the son of Zadok follows in his father's footsteps and becomes high priest in place of his father, also during the reign of Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, note this. Now King Solomon was over all Israel. These were his officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok, was the priest. And then it goes on with the rest of his officers. But there you go. Azariah, the son of Zadok, was the priest. So Zadok's family wasn't just, you know, the one-time priest. He actually passed that on to his son. All right? So Zadok's son goes on and fulfills the priestly calling after his father. But we can go even further than that. There's a very curious passage much later on in the Bible. This is from the book of Ezekiel. Now, if you remember, at the end of Ezekiel's book, he gives that very long vision of the city and the temple and the land of Israel and all the stuff happening there at the end of the age. And all that stuff is really hard to interpret. But it's very much end times, great grandiose stuff, it seems like. Well, 
in the middle of all of that, he actually notes that the sons of Zadok will be serving as priests. So whatever that means in the uh, visionary language of Ezekiel, I'll read this to you. Ezekiel 44, verse 15, as he's talking about this temple and this city that God's going to build for Israel, he says, But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares the Lord God. So there you go. I mean, whatever this means here in the book of Ezekiel, this great vision of the future, the image he gives you is the sons of Zadok serving as priests in that far distant time. So you can say Zadok has an enduring house. I mean, he makes it. He does. His sons do not fall away ultimately like uh, maybe the direct family of Eli maybe said to would have uh, experienced. The sons of Zadok keep going. He has an enduring house in some degree. Okay, one more thing about Zadok. You can see how as high priest, the prediction might be true of him that says uh, back here in, in 1 Samuel where it says, Everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, Please assign me to one of the priest's offices so that I may eat a piece of bread. Okay, so as high priest, Zadok would have been in charge of priestly appointments. He would have been in charge of saying, Okay, you get to serve in this office, you get to serve this role. You know, those people are making their livelihood off of him because he's the high priest. You can see how Zadok as high priest might actually fulfill that role whenever he becomes high priest. So there you have three reasons to consider Zadok as the faithful priest. First, he is a priest. Secondly, he has an enduring house. And thirdly, you can see how the other priests, the remnants of Eli's house, would be dependent upon him eventually. So all of that Three reasons to consider, at least, Zadok as the faithful priest. Now, that all sounds pretty good, except that I have five reasons to reject Zadok as the faithful priest. So I'm going to trump their three reasons with my five reasons and again point you to King David as a more fitting fulfillment of this faithful priest. So let's take these in order. Five reasons to reject Zadok and accept David as the faithful priest of the book of Samuel. First, Zadok is never said to be a man according to God's own heart, as the faithful priest is said to be. Remember, the faithful priest is going to be according to God's own heart and soul, and we sure hope Zadok was, but it never is actually said of him that he was a man of that caliber or a man filling that role. However, King David has called that on a, on a few occasions in the books of Samuel. So, that's one reason to tip the balance against Zadok and in favor of David. So David is certainly a man after God's own heart, a man according to God's heart and soul, whereas with Zadok, we just don't know. Second reason uh, to pass by Zadok, Zadok may have an enduring house, but that enduring house is not mentioned in the book of Samuel. Okay? Nowhere in the books of Samuel do we see any mention of God's plans for Zadok or his descendants. Zadok just isn't talked about in that way, okay? So if the author of this book wants to present Zadok as the faithful priest, he made a mistake by not mentioning the enduring house of Zadok. However, David is explicitly said to have an enduring house in the book of Samuel and is the only other person who is said to have an enduring house. So that again tips the balance in favor of David and against Zadok. My third reason is that Zadok is part of Eli's house, okay? The house of Eli, which was being rejected, Zadok is part of that, okay? Since he is Eli's great-grandson. Now remember, the whole idea of the man of God's prediction is that the house of Aaron, and especially Eli's you know, house there, is going to be replaced because of their unfaithfulness and going to be replaced by this faithful priest. That's the whole tone of that prediction. It's strange to think then that Zadok who is Eli's great-grandson, is going to come in and fill that role. Technically, he's part of the house of Eli. He's certainly part of the house of Aaron, who also, you know, the house of Aaron also catches flack in that passage, and just by association with Eli. You know, he says, you and your father's house. You know, there's not going to be an old man 
in your house or your father's house. Well, how does Zadok come in and fill the role of the faithful priest in contradistinction to that house? It's just a little weird to think that way, in my opinion. So that's my third reason to favor David over Zadok, because David, he's not in the house of Aaron. He's not related to Eli. David is a full, fresh start for the priesthood in some sense, which to me makes a lot more sense given the way that prediction is worded. Okay, that's my third reason. Here's my fourth reason. That is, we need the priesthood of David more than we need the priesthood of Zadok. It's kind of a strange way to make that point, but we need the priesthood of David more than we need the priesthood of Zadok. And here I'm thinking mainly about we need the idea of David as a priest to explain so much of the book of Samuel. Okay? Think about this. If Zadok were the faithful priest, we would do nothing more with that knowledge than write a note in the margin of our Bibles on 1 Samuel 2 and then forget about it until the next time we read 1 Samuel. You would not remember it. You would not consider it. You, by the time you got to 1 Samuel chapter 3, you would have forgotten about Zadok, okay? Because he just doesn't do anything, right? He's just not so important. There's nothing about Zadok that needs the explanation of he is the faithful priest. Meanwhile, think about David. There is so much that David does that doesn't make sense in the book of Samuel unless he is the faithful priest. Think about it. The eating of the showbread, wearing the ephod, the movements of the Ark of the Covenant and David's relationship with that. Those things, they're just so weird. They sound, you're like, you read the book of Samuel and you say to yourself, why did David do that? Why is this happening? How does this make sense? Well, as I've been demonstrating in my past messages, if David is the faithful priest, all of those things make sense. You need David to be the faithful priest mentioned in 1 Samuel 2, or else you can't explain so much of the rest of the book. There's so much of the book of Samuel that does not make sense unless David is the faithful priest. But with Zadok, it doesn't carry that kind of weight. With Zadok, it's just like, oh, okay, Zadok's the faithful priest. Moving along to 1 Samuel 3. Now, you just don't need Zadok to be the faithful priest, but we need David to be that faithful priest. Otherwise, the books of Samuel just don't make as much sense. Okay, one more reason to reject Zadok in favor of David as the faithful priest, and that is that Zadok is such a minor character. And this is kind of a restatement of things I've already been saying, but I think it's worth saying separately. Zadok is such a minor character in the books of Samuel that you can't see him filling any real important role like being the faithful priest. You know, Zadok, who is Zadok? I had to explain to you who he was. I mean, you probably didn't give, you probably never gave that man much thought at all in your reading of the Bible until tonight, okay? He's just such a minor character. And you would expect something more of this faithful priest than being such a minor character. A lot of time is spent at the beginning of 1 Samuel talking about the status quo of Israel at that time, the wickedness of Eli and his sons, this man of God that comes out of nowhere with this lambasting prophecy against them and this prediction of someone to replace them. A lot of time is spent on this. You get the feeling it's important. And then it's just like, huh, Zadok. Zadok is such a minor character, it doesn't seem to matter. It takes, it's, a, it's an anti-climax. There's a good word for it. It's an anti-climax to see Zadok as the fulfillment of the faithful priest. But if David is the faithful priest, that's like, whoa, you mean David is actually a priest as well as a king? Yeah, I can kind of see that. Now that I look through the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and see some of these passages, yeah, I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. That's really helpful. That's a climax. That's, that's actually something worth reading about. But if Zadok is the faithful priest, it's just like, ah, well, who cares about Zadok? And why is he so important? Does he, re does he really deserve this prediction that was made about him? It just doesn't make sense to me to have such a minor character fill such an important role, or a role that seems to be important here at the very beginning of 1 Samuel. So those are my five reasons, just to give them again, to reject Zadok in favor of David as the faithful priest, uh, first of all, in here, first of all, Zadok is never said to be a man after God's own heart. David is. 
Zadok, uh, his enduring house is never actually mentioned in the books of Samuel, but David's is. Zadok is technically a part of Eli's house, which is being rejected, whereas David is not a member of that house. Fourthly, we need the priesthood of David more than we need the priesthood of Zadok. And then finally, Zadok is just such a minor character. I don't see him filling such an important role. So for those five reasons, I don't think we should really bother with Zadok as the fulfillment of the faithful priest prediction. I think it's a lot more uh, satisfying to the evidence to point to David. So there you go. Uh, Zadok was the only other candidate besides David and Samuel. And Samuel doesn't really qualify. Zadok I don't think really qualifies. So that leaves King David as the faithful priest of the books of Samuel. There you go. Hopefully that puts David on very firm footing in your minds. But there is this one nagging question left. This is where we get to my third goal for tonight. This nagging question, how does David fulfill the fifth assertion about this faithful priest, as I have called it? This fifth assertion has to do with walking before God's anointed always. So we'll go back here to 1 Samuel 2, verse 35. He says, He will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul, and I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before my anointed always. That's what I mean by the fifth assertion. I call it that because it's the fifth one in this message, the one I have not yet dealt with, the one I'm dealing with last. Okay, so to walk before somebody, that is a very Hebrew way of saying to serve someone. Okay, If, if so-and-so walks before so-and-so, that means this person is serving this person. That's just what they call it, okay? That's, their, that's one of their ways of describing service. Now, to anoint, the anointed one, it says here, he will walk before my anointed always. Of course, to anoint someone is to sprinkle oil on their head, you know, oil being the, the crushed uh, juice of olives and stuff like that. And of course, this is what they did to designate a person as a king or maybe as a priest in the official ceremony where you king them or make them a priest, you consecrate them you sprinkle oil on their heads, that's called anointing. So this we have some anointed one, right? You know, here, talked about here in this, uh, this prediction. And this faithful priest is going to serve this anointed one always. So I have not yet discussed how King David might fulfill that assertion, that prediction here. That's not because I have no clue how he does, but it's actually because I have three possible options there, three options for how he might fulfill this. So I want to talk about all of them just in turn. In general, I favor the explanations that come later, uh, but I want to talk about all of them because they're all beneficial to consider. So let's talk about explanation number one for how David fulfills this part of the prediction. Explanation number one is that David serves King Saul. Okay, David serves King Saul. Now, one of the most common ways of referring to King Saul in the books of Samuel is the Lord's anointed. Okay, that's what he's called. In fact, the person who calls him that the most is David himself. You know, the alleged faithful priest of the books of Samuel is the one who most often refers to King Saul as the Lord's anointed. And of course, he was anointed as king by Samuel. So that's where he would get the title of the Lord's anointed. Okay, so King Saul being the Lord's anointed, and David for a time was a servant of King Saul. He served as a commander of part of his military, and even when Saul was beginning to get, par get paranoid and trying to kill David, David remained faithful for a long time. So you see David serving King Saul, perhaps that is the fulfillment of this part of the prediction. Now, that'd be pretty helpful. I mean, let's say you're an Israelite. You're there. You're wondering to yourself, who is this faithful priest? Well, you need to be looking for someone who is in service to the Lord's anointed. And Saul was anointed as king. David is a servant of King Saul. Hey, maybe David is the faithful priest. That's useful to people living at that time and trying to figure out who the faithful priest was. 
That's a pretty strong argument, right? I think that makes sense. If this interpretation has any problem, it pertains to the word always. Or at least in the NASB it says always, right? Because David was a relative latecomer to the court of King Saul. King Saul was king for a good long while before David showed up. And strictly speaking, David didn't serve King Saul for very long before he became an outlaw and was on the run. And then was a fugitive from King Saul. So you might look at the word always and say, does David really warrant the word always in his servant of King Saul, in his service of King Saul? Yeah, language can be kind of loose, but really always, does, does David really qualify for that? And those of you reading the ESV, you have an even stronger word there. <clears throat> Your Bible says forever, I think. I think it says forever. Those ESV people, you get that? Okay, there you go, thank you. Forever. Well, did David really serve King Saul forever? Eh, probably not. Doesn't seem to work. So, you know, that's a matter of translation and what the sense intended is. But still, this explanation kind of works, but has some rough edges to it. That's explanation number one. It's not my favorite one. I think it's possible. It's just not the best option. So let's go on to explanation number two. Explanation number two is the house of David serves King David. Okay, The house of David serves King David. Now let's look again at this statement here. The statement as it reads in most Bible translations is something like this. He, emphasis on he, he will walk before my anointed always. Okay. Now there's another way to translate the word he there. You could translate it it. Okay. In Hebrew, the way they talk, every he, every it is called a he. That's just the way they view it. They don't have a word it. Okay. They just don't have that word. In, them, in their language, everything is either a he or a she, okay? And most of the things we would call an it are called a he in Hebrew, okay? So you could translate this, an it will walk before my anointed always. The it referring back to the enduring house, okay? I will build him an enduring house, and it will walk before my anointed always, okay? So translating it as it. Now, that would mean that the enduring house of David is viewed as serving King David forever. Okay? Now, that might seem a little odd to you, but remember, think like an ancient Israelite. You're very patriarchal. You care very much about ancestry. The son never rises above the father. That's just kind of how it works in their culture. So King David being the beginning of that house, all of his descendants, all of his sons are viewed very much as his servants. Okay? They are lesser than he is, okay? That's how they would view that. So it's possible that this statement here is meant to convey that image, that this, uh, this faithful priest is going to have an enduring house. This enduring house is going to have, you know, this position here underneath David. And in this case, David is the Lord's anointed, which of course makes sense because David was anointed as king eventually. So he can fill that role after King Saul. And that's how this explanation might work. Now, I think this works pretty well. There is maybe one hang-up with it. And that is, I can think of one member of the house of David who cannot be viewed as a servant of King David. And hopefully you bunch of Christians can tell me who that is. Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus, we call him the greater, you know, David's greater son, right? We call him that. And Jesus even goes to that passage from one of the Psalms later about that. You know, if you, if, uh, you know, he says, if uh, the Messiah is David's son, how does he call him Lord? He, in their way of thinking, the, the son and the father, I mean, they're like this. I mean, the father is always above the son. So how would David look to someone later on in his house and call him Lord? And of course, Jesus has a point in bringing up that passage. But my point right now is, there is at least one member of the house of David that cannot be said to walk before the Lord's anointed as in King David, right? It just doesn't work that way. So maybe every other member of the house of David, that qualifies, but there's at least one that breaks the mold there, okay? Maybe not a terrible problem. Maybe you don't think that's a big problem, but it's a bit of a rough edge on this second explanation. So it's not my favorite. I like this explanation better than the first one, but it's not my favorite. My favorite one is actually the third explanation which I'll talk about right now. 
Explanation number three for how he walks before the anointed, God's anointed always, and that is David serves the Messiah. Okay, the Messiah. And of course, by the Messiah, I mean the ultimate anointed one. That's what that word means, the anointed one. And of course, this is what we call Jesus, who is God's great future king, now the present king, actually, because uh, he's already been reigning. But David serves the Messiah. David serves Jesus, in other words. Now, with this explanation, I go back to understanding the he as being David. So he will walk before my anointed always. Just forget all that it stuff that I talked about. I'm going back here to calling it a he. But now the anointed is not King Saul and not King David. This time it is the anointed one. It is the Messiah, the ultimate anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so we can certainly imagine in the grand eternal scheme of things, David being a servant of Christ. After all, everything happening in the reign of King David is just part of God's greater plan leading to Jesus. And right now in heaven, I guarantee you, David is very faithfully serving Jesus in whatever way they can serve him up there in heaven. And for all eternity future, it's going to be that way. I mean, I think you see here how this could work, seeing David as the eternal servant of this later, greater anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus. That probably jives pretty well with you. I think you probably see how that works in your mind. If there's any problem to this, it's the fact that the word anointed one is never used clearly in the book of Samuel to refer to the Messiah. I mean, the late, the later, greater anointed one, Jesus. There's one passage where you might argue for it. I don't want to get sidetracked on that because it's still kind of an if. But there's no place where the books of Samuel clearly refer to the Messiah. Okay? Now that could be a problem, right? It's like, well, Stan, you've got to interpret things by context, right? And in the context of the book of Samuel, you don't really see the later great king called the anointed one. So does this interpretation really work? Well, let me put, another, let me put a different spin on that for you, okay? Let's talk about the effect that this ambiguity would have. I mean, here you are. Let's say you're reading this. He will walk before my anointed always. Now let's say you've come to the conclusion that the anointed one is not King Saul, not King David. Who is he? There's mystery there. There's ambiguity. What is the effect of that lack of knowledge, that question mark in your mind? Well, put it in the broader context of the Old Testament. Okay? As you read the Old Testament, you get this gradually growing expectation of what God is going to do in history. Okay? God doesn't tell you everything up front. Over time, prophet by prophet, God gives you more and more ideas as to what he's going to do in history. In the earlier stages of Israel's history, you don't really know much about what God's going to do. If you were living back in the time of Moses, say, you don't really know a whole lot about God's later plan. You haven't really learned a whole lot yet. Later on, when you get to the time of some of the later prophets, you know a lot more because you've seen a lot more. God has spoken more. So you understand more. And eventually, Israel gets a relatively full idea of the kingdom of God and the Messiah and everything associated with him. Remember that the book of Samuel is still relatively early in that history. We're still living at a phase where God is still gradually revealing just a little bit of his plan for history. He hasn't said a whole lot yet. He has said some things, but not a whole lot. With that perspective, you would actually expect a very unclear reference to the Messiah at this stage in history. You would expect a passage saying that there's going to be an anointed one. It's like, an anointed one? You mean a special anointed one? Well, who is he? What do we know about him? Can you say more? And the prophet would say, no, <laughs> because it's not time for you to know more yet. God is gradually revealing this. At this stage in Israel's history, it actually makes sense to see this kind of unclear, off-handed reference to Jesus. Because again, this is the phase where you don't know a whole lot. God is still gradually revealing things. So to see this random, unclear reference to the anointed one, God's anointed one, and not really know who it is or what he's going to do, that actually makes sense to me as I view the whole perspective of the Old Testament. 
So rather than being an argument against this explanation, I think it's an argument in its favor. I think it fits with how God is gradually revealing his plan for the anointed one throughout the Old Testament. At this stage in history, I think it makes sense to have this kind of statement made about Jesus. So that is my preferred explanation for, what, uh, for how David fulfills this assertion here. So he will walk before my anointed always. I see the he as King David, as the faithful priest, and then the anointed one, I see that as being Christ, and David serves Christ always, eternally. So that's my preferred explanation. I think the other two do work. They're just not as good in my mind. I like this one better. I think it fits better. Uh, but that's all I'm going to say about those. The real, thing, the real point I want to make is you can come to this part of the prediction and make an argument for how King David fulfills even this part of the prediction about the faithful priest, which means, again, David is the faithful priest, the whole point of this series. So that is the major point I wanted to make tonight, which by this point, you should see how as you go through this prediction made by the man of God, in all five of its assertions, you can see how David comes in and fills this role. So maybe we'll review those. First of all, David does function in a priestly role, so he can be the faithful priest. He does have an enduring house, like the, like the faithful priest is supposed to. Uh, secondly, David is called a man after God's own heart, which matches the language describing the faithful priest. Uh, the remnants of the house of Eli and the house of Aaron do have a dependent a dependent role to King David. They do serve him and are relying, they are relying upon him. And then finally, you can see how David ties in here in this service to, to God's anointed one. So all five of those assertions, I think you can see, we have a pretty strong argument here for King David as the faithful priest mentioned here in 1 Samuel 2. And that was the big thing I wanted to say tonight. Samuel doesn't really fit the bill. Uh, Zadok makes a little bit more of an argument, but still not a very good one in comparison to David. So Samuel and Zadok are out. That leaves only King David. And that at this point, just viewing the passage as a part of the books of Samuel, I think we're on pretty firm footing for seeing King David as the faithful priest. However, we cannot end the series here, which is why there is one more message in this series. Next time when I teach, I will try to explain how all this stuff about the priesthood of King David fits into a total Bible picture. So greater biblical teaching. We're going to take all this stuff about King David as a faithful priest and see why it matters and how it fits into the rest of the Bible. And hopefully that will solve any remaining questions you have by that point. But that is all I'm going to say tonight unless there are specific questions which I will try to answer. Or if there are comments at this point, that is also fair game. Are there questions or comments at this point here in the message?